thank you for joining me once again on jamaicans.com for shelf life remember as always like the page drop a comment in the section below and share this with your friends Welcome to Shelf Life. Today my guest is Diane Batchelor, the author of God in the Meantime, a powerful story about love and waiting on God. She's a former language educator and a former shipping executive. She now lives in Panama with her husband for the past 16 years and she's the co-founder of the Hibiscus Group for Moms. She's best known as a singer with the Christian group New Creation Generation International. And she describes herself as having a heart for ladies in waiting. We'll hear more about that. She's a survivor of a rare congenital brain condition. And her book, God in the Meantime, is all about faith. Join me on this conversation. Diane, 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 welcome, welcome, welcome. God in the Meantime. Quite a title, quite a book. How are you doing today? I'm good, thank you. How about you? I'm good. I'm good. Hanging in there, giving God thanks. You know, mm -hmm. things could have been worse, especially in this time. But exactly. good to see you. Good to see you. Looking good. Thank you. You too. <laughs> thanks. Now we've I done all of that. American flags and everything. Your man have to represent. That's After right. <laughs> anywhere you go in this world, I am a Jamaican. And That's you know, right. I tell people all the time, I can't imagine being anything else. I think the whole world wants to be Jamaican, don't you? Yes, but we don't <laughs> want them all. <laughs> that too, that too. So, Diane, you live in Panama. Before we even get to the book, how you end up in Panama? Well, when I tell people, I think they think that I made this up, but I'll tell you what really happened. In the first year of our marriage, we went to bed and we both woke up with a dream that we had to tell each other. And when we told each other the dreams that we had had, we realized that we had had the same dream. Basically, we were in some kind of a Spanish-speaking country where there were these tribal people. And, um, you know, we, just, we, we both had this interaction with this, with this um, Spanish country with tribal people. So over the years, and it took quite a few years, we began to see other things that God had spoken to us. So we believed that God must have been pointing us. And I had studied linguistics at the university. So I thought, oh yeah, that means I'm going to go to one of these countries and probably translate the Bible into a tribal language. That's what I thought. But I saw the years pass, my life was going on in a different um, trend. And then it came back to us again. We both began to say, you know, everything else God has said to us has happened. But what about this Spanish country? So we, um, funnily enough, began to look at sending or going, migrating for a little while, not to stay, but to migrate for a little while. To, we were saying to a country where everything is on time and you know things are a little more ordered. We wanted our children to see that, to re realize that there's more to, to life. And so we thought, and then we also wanted them to be immersed in another language. Do you so, speak Spanish? I do speak Spanish, okay. yes. And I had done a smattering of French as well. So, you know, I know what it does to you to, to get a chance to experience another language. So we um, were looking at the time at Vancouver, okay. which is a, is a place I've visited and fallen in love with. Beautiful. You know? Love it. Of, of all the places, because every time, you know, as a Jamaican, every, every place I go, I say, mm, it's all right, but not like Jamaica. It's all right, but not like Jamaica. Before the plane landed in Vancouver, I was like, this is a beautiful country. Just to see the hills and the, and the, the, the sea, that, that juxtaposition, it was like, yes. And I, I end, ended up having great friends from Vancouver okay. who offered to do anything they could to help us to move to Canada. And I should have been over the moon. And instead I was like, thank you so much, you know, like just being kind and polite. And I'm like, that is strange. Why am I not jumping up and down? Because mm -hmm. I had before said, if I ever migrated, that's where I would go. Okay. Right after that, now I came home. We we're, were actually on holidays in Vancouver with them, in um, Winnipeg with them when they said that. So we came, I came home and said, you know, I don't want to look at gift horse in the mouth. I'm filling out for Canada, but nothing inside of me looking. 
feeling it. Then I look on the internet one day and there was this thing, Panama, a haven for retirees. At the time I was nowhere near, near retirement, you know. But something inside of me just jumped. And I visited Panama and it was just a country. It never really held me. I'm like, what is this? So I began to search on the internet. And the more I searched, the more I get excited. So I called Selwyn. Selwyn came home from where that day. I showed him and he had the same reaction. Now Selwyn does not speak a word of Spanish and language is just not his thing. That's okay, he has you. <laughs> you know? So I'm like, what is this? So it just happened that we were having a conference in Panama, a business conference in Panama. Mm -hmm. that, like we'd seen it like September or October and the conference was slated for November. So we said, when we come, we'll check it out. Well, by the time we came, we had already found the school that the children were going to be All in. Right. We, we had, I mean, we had in five days, to cut us a long story short, we had found a place to rent, bought furniture, got the children into school, opened bank account, pay down on this home that we're living in now, in five days. And if you know Panama, that's a miracle. You, anyway, sound, like, so, you sound like me and Michael, because that's the kind of thing we would do. We were in Costa Rica for five days and went back and said, okay, let's find a place to live. And the only reason, only reason we did not move was because we had some family issues going on um, here at the time. And we, were, we had to come back and deal with that. There you go. Panama there is go. on my list. It's on my there, list. You, you, you are welcome to visit. <laughs> No, to live. Yes. <laughs> to live. Oh, to live. Well, there you go. There you go. <laughs> All right. Yes. So that's how you end up in Panama. And you have a that's group how we ended up in Panama. That you, formed in, you have a group that you formed in Panama. And that's well, I'm a part, I'm a part of, a, of, a, of a ladies' Bible study, which is very, um, very integral. But the group I think you're referring to is actually what has become an international group now. I started a group for, for, for um, ladies, women, um, mothers in particular oh, okay. in Jamaica, which we called Hibiscus Moms. And Moms at the time was an acronym for Morning Out for Mothers. Okay. Because of course, um, moms who stayed home with their children, which I did when I finally had my children, you tend to just be stuck in baby land. Mm -hmm. You have no adult anything. And after, I mean, I always wanted to do that. But when I came home, I was like, mm, that gets old fast. You want, you want adult, adult um, companionship as well as just the support in some of the things like, you know. <laughs> mother's, groups are, mother's groups are very essential, um, you know, exactly. to, because after a while you forget how to even speak like an adult. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm talking to exactly. you. Exactly. So, so, so that's how Hibiscus Moms okay. was born. And, and it's been revived and it, we're doing, the people scattered all over the world. Oh, now. wonderful. We still meet weekly and um, now by Zoom. Yes. And um, we support each other now that our, or babies are now like all grown adults. Yes. Lovely, lovely. So let's get to God in the meantime. And I, I'm not going to spoil it for people because there are some things that you read and you hear and you think you know what it means, like meantime. But you put a spin on that. What does your title mean? Well, it's a, it's a what would they call it, a, a double entendre because mm -hmm. on the one hand, I, I mean... Meanwhile, mm -hmm. while you're waiting, but I also mean when you look at somebody and say, how oh, you're so mean. Mm -hmm. And the truth is there were many times in my upbringing that I thought God was so mean. Like I'm, you're bigger than me, so you can do what you want to do. That kind of attitude towards God. Mm -hmm. And I really thought, you know, some things that he had denied me in life, that those were just his meanness. Okay. But I had an experience, and over the years, but this particular experience, which I have to mention, is that I, funnily enough, we are in the month, October is Arterial Venous Malformation Awareness Month, mm -hmm. AVM Awareness Month, and it was actually, yesterday marked three years that I had a, a brain hemorrhage, wow. and it was this, this malformation that I didn't know of, that ruptured. Which, and, which I learned about in your book. That well, you there you that, go. That, that, there was, you that go. was the first time I was hearing about it. The first time I ever heard about it was when I realized I had it, <laughs> that I'd been born with it. That's a weird thing. But, but, the, but the thing that it did for me was to see how all the things that God had withheld from me that I thought was his meanness was him in the meantime helping me towards an end. And I'll just give a little bit of a spoiler. 
um, I, was, I, was, I was called when I finally did get pregnant after 14 years of marriage. I was called a mature preemie gravida. I hated that word so much because what it, what it meant was you're an old woman first pregnancy. And I was like, really hated it. Well, that de designation made sure that my doctor insisted that I would not have my children naturally. Right. And now I know that if I had had my children naturally, I could have. Lost your life. Best, best case scenario, ended up with not being able to move or walk right. or speak or see or something like that. Worst case scenario, I could have just died on the table, you know? So, so I look back now and I go, wow, I thought you were so mean. But in the meantime, what you were doing was saving my life. Wow. And so my book is about that kind it's of thing. It's about that. It's, it's interesting how that, that happens because, you know, in Jamaica, we always say, boy, when you're late, <laughs> we, we, te we, we, we tend to have a tendency to be late. And people always say, boy, you don't know what God was saving you from, you know, why you're late. Maybe if you did come early, you would have a crash on the corner or something. You never know. In the you're meantime, when God appears to be mean and things appear to be not going your way, what yes. God is actually doing. I can think of exactly. many times in my own life where I have been denied or delayed mm -hmm. and frustrated that I'm being delayed and being denied exactly. only to realize further down the road mm -hmm. what was happening is I was being prepared for what was to come. And that is if it. I had not gone through that, I would not have been ready. Exactly. To, to and, and you know, the part that we hate is what you say. Further down the road. Further down the road, yeah. If we, we don't want ball, if we had a crystal ball and we could see what's down the road, we would be patient. Exactly, but exactly. We don't have the crystal ball. We can, we, we're we're like we want it now. <laughs> microwave society. But speaking exactly. of microwave society, so the first half of your book is really dedicated to you waiting for your husband. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and as I read on and on, it got funnier and funnier and funnier because you said that God spoke to you, told you who you were supposed to marry, when you were supposed to marry. You just couldn't see it happening. It just was not happening. You couldn't figure out how that was going to happen. Before we get to your story, though, you know, it's a, a common thing for single women to get to a certain point of desperation when they don't see marriage coming. Although in today's world, in the modern world, you have mm -hmm. way more women who are opting not to get married at all. Exactly. They're yes. opting to have career. They're opting to even have families without getting married. They've mm -hmm. seen the complications. They've seen the pain and agony of their friends' marriages and their parents' marriages. And, um, you know, they're opting not to do that. But mm -hmm. you were very, very purpose-driven and specific <laughs> <laughs> about Selwyn. Well, you know, it's so funny because I started out very purpose-driven and specific against that because I had, I had just um, come out of teenagerhood. I was probably 19 when this all started. And I remember thinking, you know what? I loved it when I would like John Brown today and tomorrow. I don't like him again. And I like Tom Stokes and today. And the freedom of just switching who I like because I never mentioned it. Nobody knew it was my, my secret. But whenever I began to say or to suggest that I like you or whatever, even people who were my great friends, eventually, you know, things just began to be stayed and stick between us. And I hated that. So I began to really ask God. I said, Lord, you know, I just want a brother. I just want somebody who can just be my bona fide brethren without this kind of attachment. And by the strangest ways when you read a book, Selwyn became that. Mm -hmm. So when he approached me at first, I was like, no style. This is just, this is, you know, this is happening because we are great friends and we like each other. We give it a chance and it will pass. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, he agreed with me. He said, all right, then, you know, and he was a gentleman and he left it alone. And we continued being friends. And then I heard God speak to me. And I was like, you are just kidding me. <laughs> and, and, and that was when I began to search my heart and realize that, you know what, I really like him for true. So, so my thing was, you know, maybe, you know, if he come again, because I'm expecting, you know, he can come again. But he never come again. 
instead. But I'm not going to tell the whole story. No, don't but, tell the whole story because I'm going to tell the story. And I love, I have my favorite part of that story was when he met your father. When it, that was my favorite part of that story. I laughed and laughed and laughed. This book is funny. It is witty. But what I love about it is your honesty. You told your story. And I, I, I get to say this to so few people. <laughs> you told your story with such honesty and such clarity and in a language that everybody could understand. And so, uh, you know, what do you say to young ladies who are in waiting? Because you style yourself as somebody who... Um, it's all about the ladies in waiting. You minister to ladies in waiting. And ladies in waiting, for those of us from the British system, are those ladies that are standing beside the Queen. So, <laughs> Not in this case. <laughs> what exactly do you mean by the ladies in waiting? And what do you have to say to them? Okay, what I will say, and I, I, I put it with a, with a what do you call it now, uh, a clause. I put, I, I put this, this, I forget the word, but it's caveat. caveat. Thank you. That's the word I'm looking for. I put it with a caveat. Now, what I'm going to say to you is not necessarily what I practiced, okay? This is now my age, and I now have more sense, and now I can look back, <laughs> and I can say this. There is, you know, and I hated it when my mother said it. I hated it so much. There is no rush. But for real, there is no rush. There is no rush. It, 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 it makes sense for you to take the time. How I've now come to put it is be very selfish before you go into a marriage. Be very selfish. Make sure that you are looking and finding someone, not because of desperation. It's wor there are worse things than being single. Mm -hmm. And the worst thing is to be joined with somebody who just destroys you, who, who, who just... Um, inhibits you from being who God has made you to be. Mm -hmm. So my thing is, don't rush into marriage. Take the time to be, to be specific with God, to be specific with yourself. Find out who you really are and what you really need. You know, and then, take, and then be selfish. Don't just accept whatever comes along. However, when you do get into marriage, then of course you're going to be selfless. And yeah. you're going to, you know. But before, be picky. Be selfish. Not, not, not like, you know, what Karim drove. Yeah, and I, I know. Robbie. We're talking character. Because more than anything else, you know, all the prettiness and the whatever, you know, I look at myself Babe. and I say, you know, yeah, I, I, I realized that that morning when I had the brain hemorrhage, I could have ended up with my face all sorts of ways, you know, and then whatever physical attraction that there was would no longer be. But the inside doesn't change. The character... And so that's what you want to look for. But I'm, I'm lecturing some woman who is probably sitting there going, rolling her eyes, let me stop. <laughs> like I would have done at one point. <laughs> exactly. Like but honestly, <laughs> I'm really with you. My challenge is that the church, you're a Christian, I'm a Christian. The church tends to push these young people into marriage. You know, they, they, they beat them over the head a lot of the times with the better to something than burn to, to burn, marry than to marry burn. Than burn and all kinds of stuff and i had a con I, I was part of a conversation because i my husband and i we are advocates and we are volunteers of jamaica youth for christ so we work with a lot of young uh -huh, people, okay films and all that kind of stuff and we work with a lot of young people and i was at one of the churches uh earlier this year bc before covid and <laughs> you see i have a good one <laughs> and heard this conversation because one couple had just gotten engaged and another one had just gotten married and there was like this one single man walking around in the church young good looking you know single man very talented and they were teasing him and saying man it's your turn your turn and him said listen man i'm not ready no you mean by you're not ready you're not ready and i had to jump in i said leave the man alone exactly leave him alone there's nothing wrong with being single he can be single as long as he wants to be single Exactly. And so I have those conversations, you know, with, with the, especially the young ladies and the young men that, listen, I have failed at it in the past. Okay. This is not my first marriage. I have failed at it in the past. I know what it is to rush and to fail. I know what that is. And there so you I think your book should be required reading. <laughs> it should be required reading for all single Christian young people. 
to understand okay. that you can hear the voice of God about what it is that you you know you want and what He wants for you, and yes. and wait. But before we go on, I want you to read that passage for me. Read, read okay. Yes, I'm gonna read. I'm gonna read a section that takes us a little further down the road okay. of the romance. <laughs> It was, this one is called, it's chapter 18 called Unbended Me. It was the 1982 Easter holidays and Selwyn, who had again become aloof, disappeared to his junior doctor brother's cottage at the Princess Margaret Hospital in the rural parish of St. Thomas. It was clear that he was in turmoil and had gone there to clear his head. By this time, Marjorie and Al were solidly a couple and frequent visitors to the townhouse I shared with a childhood neighbor and family friend. For those who don't understand the concept, let me explain. Because the knowledge will prove useful if you want to understand what comes next. A townhouse is a row of joined houses. In our case, it was a row of two-story houses, and we were the second to last at the end of the row. Hold on to that detail. It will explain why I responded to Marjorie with the bemused patience of a mother trying to soothe her groggy child back to bed after an episode of bizarre sleep talk. I had gotten up in time to hear Miss McLean, as we called her, shut the door and leave for work. As all serious UE students know, the Easter holidays were a crucial time of preparation for the upcoming final exams. That's why I'm going to imagine that we had spent some part of the night in serious study and were therefore finding it difficult to start the day. It may or may not have happened that way. I do know, however, that it had to be at least 7.30 a.m. I had just re-entered re the bedroom from the adjoining bathroom when Marjorie bolted out of bed, walked over to the rear-facing window of my second floor bedroom, and peering through the louvers at the backyard, declared that Selwyn was outside. Now, remember what that detail I asked you to hold on to? That one about the configuration of a townhouse? Yes, that one. Well, here is where that detail comes in handy. Selwyn couldn't have possibly been in our backyard. He was all the way in St. Thomas. And even if he had returned to Kingston, there was no way for him to be in our backyard. One's only access to one's backyard in a townhouse is from having first passed through one's own front door, from, of own front door. Marjorie had to be mistaken. She must have been sleep talking. With that in mind, and in the spirit of humoring rather than antagonizing a sleepwalker, I sidled over to the window, and in my most placating tone, I said, See, Marjorie, Selwyn is not. I stopped in mid-sentence, the words trapped in my throat, for as I peered through the louvers, I found myself staring into the grinning, upturned face of none other than Selwyn Lloyd Bachelor. How was that possible? Miss McLean had already left for work. She had securely locked the doors and security gates. How did he gain access to our backyard? For him to do that, he would have had to scale a few fences and walk through the backyard of nearly all our neighbors along the row. But there he was in the flesh. My sleepwalker friend Marjorie had actually responded to the sound of pebbles hitting against the window louvers. My rear-facing bedroom, paired with Miss McLean's having already left for work, made it impossible for anyone to hear Selwyn's repeated knocks at the outer front gate. Undaunted and determined, he had done the unthinkable. He had trespassed through a row of at least six backyards before finally arriving below my bedroom window. Cue the panic. I had not long got out of bed. I hadn't even washed my face or brushed my teeth. I was still in my pajamas. How was I going to get myself looking presentable enough to let him in? Good friend better than pocket money. 
That's the Jamaican proverb that took on new meaning at that point. Marjorie would keep him distracted at the window while I did the super shuffle of a speed change. I may have missed a few steps in my evolutions, but heart racing and palms sweaty, I managed to open the back door and then the grilled gate, all the while painfully aware that my every move was under scrutiny. He hadn't taken his eyes off me. Sensing the moment, Marge, who had been unceremoniously awakened from her sleep and had herself not had time to properly dress, let alone have breakfast, hurriedly stashed her things into her overnight bag and made a hasty retreat. In an instant, I was alone with the man who I now claimed as the love of my life but nothing prepared me for what happened next. All right, that's a good place to stop. <laughs> that's a perfect, perfect place to leave them hanging. That's a perfect place to leave them hanging. Boy, I'm telling you, that, that story was funny too. That was really, really funny. And I liked the way how you kind of broke it into small bites, you know, into Thanks. small pieces so that everybody could read a bit, absorb and totally grab that in. But before we go, let's talk a little bit about your singing. I meant to talk oh. about that at the beginning because you're an author, but you're really a singer. Yes, I guess I am. <laughs> you know, I, I never really um, label myself that way, but I guess I am. Mm -hmm. I have sung with um, New Creation, um, which is a group that was very popular. As a matter of fact, I speak about that. Marjorie and Al, who I mentioned here, Marjorie is the, our lead soprano singer, and um, her husband, Al, is the keyboard player okay. and um, we have been together we met at the University of the West Indies in 1979 that is to tell you how long mm -hmm. and this is this is one of the God stories of my life is that right now as we speak with with our group being scattered all over the world we are still ministering together that is brilliant that, that is that's amazing and our group is now called new creation Generation International. Why is that? We're all over, that's the international part. Mm -hmm. Generation is because now we have our children, not uh, all of them, but some of our children, actually actively involved in the ministry. And more than anything, we believed from those days that God had called us to be a community before we became singers. Right. So, before, so we are a community of worshipers, and therefore the community part is what is the, the, the lifeblood of the ministry oh, that comes up to us. Brilliant. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Dan. It has been wonderful, wonderful chatting with you. We have to chat some more again off camera, both Panama. <laughs> Let me see where I'll end up because the world is big. And you know what? I, do, I believe I'm not a tree. I'm not planted. And therefore there the go. whole world is where I want to live. Earth is the so I, will, I will see you when I come to Panama. But I want to say thank Good. you so much for being on Shelf Life today. Good. It has been thank wonderful. You. And thank I'll you. catch you again when the next book comes out. Thank you. And before I go, I just want to remind people that the book is available on Amazon. Yes. Um, both as an e-book and as a, a paperback book. Which so, is how I am. Um, <laughs> <search it up. laughs> yeah. I'm sorry? Which is how I have it. Paperback book. Love my paperback. That's right. I'm a paperback book person yes. too, but well, it's thank there. Thank you so, so much, Dan, and I'll catch you next time. Thank you so much. It's been lovely meeting with you. <laughs> thank you so much for watching Shelf Life. It has been fun, and I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope that we were able to build a little faith in you. I'll see you again next time, same place, same time, right here for another Shelf Life. Remember, check out my website, jfalunreed.com, for the shows that you missed, and Find out more about me.